I've seen, believe, achieve. This is former UFC middleweight champion of the world, Michael Bisping. Paddy the Baddy here, and you're listening to Combat Sports UK. And you're watching Combat Sports UK. Hey everybody, before you jump into this week's Combat Sports UK podcast, I've got some exciting news for you. Do you want to look as stylish as Thomas Shelby when you train? Do you want to experience the comfort that can only be achieved by a cup of tea on a cold day? Well, good news for you guys. X Marshall has partnered with us, Combat Sports UK. They are the fastest growing brand in martial arts for a reason. They are making waves and taking practitioners with their slick, stylish and hilarious designs that are fit for a king. From rash guards to shorts, streetwear and more, X Marshall has got you covered. X Marshall is an extremely community oriented brand, having given away over $50,000 in free gear last year alone, as well as sponsoring over 300 athletes. And if you shop using the code CSUK10 at checkout, you can get 10% off everything in store. That code again is CSUK10 at checkout. Go and check out xmarshall.com and enjoy the fight. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Combat Sports UK MMA podcast. Taylor Collard, as always. And I'm delighted to be joined by not just one, but two gentlemen today. First of all, introducing Brandon Vogt. You'll have seen Brandon on the channel doing his bits and pieces of some of our shorts, but now he's he's joining in the long-form conversation. Brandon, how are you, mate? I'm good, Taylor. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. I'm looking forward to it. Fantastic. Great to have you, mate. And a man with more tattoos than Dan Hooker himself. It is John <laughs> Gamebred Bogoslavsky. John, how are you, mate? Good, good. Yeah, I'm re- Hooker looks unrecognizable. Uh, completely different from like three years ago. Uh, so I don't think I'll ever get those tattoos, but you know, good for him. Good for him. Yeah, and they're they're uh, they're not good tattoos, really, are they? To be honest, no, they're not. They're not great. Hey, it's a personal uh, personal artistic vision he has. So I won't come. I won't say anything. <laughs> I like it. I like it. And we are, of course, here to preview UFC 305, which is going on down under in Perth. Um, Israel Adesanya coming back to take on Drickers Dupla. See, this kind of feels like a title fight that's been in the works for a couple of years now since their, since their face-off after Drickers beat, well, beat the brakes off poor Robert Whittaker. Um, and then obviously Izzy lost to Sean. Drickers beat Sean by split decision. Hell of a fight. What do you think, Brandon? I think this is, as you say, it's one that's been that's been in the line for a couple of years now. Um, obviously, last time out, it was meant to happen. Drakus got injured, so it didn't happen. As he took the opportunity to fight Sean Strickland, when in hindsight, he didn't really have to take that fight. But it's now came full circle. Um, as you say, Drakus has defended the belt, or sorry, he's won the belt against Strickland. And he also picked up a really good one against Whitaker. So it'll be really interesting. I, I, I think this all comes down to what version of Adesanya we see on Saturday night. If it's the version against Strickland, or that we've seen against Strickland, I think Drakus Duplessis he will run through him, to be honest. But if we see the revitalized and the and the Adesanya that came in there for the Piera fight when he knocked him out, if we see that Adesanya, we're in for a hell of a fight. It's a good first contribution to the pod, that, mate. John, what, what do you <laughs> reckon, mate? What, where, where are you sitting on this fight? Adesanya's return, Drickus in general? Yeah, well, Brandon brought up some good points. That it depends what kind of Izzy we see. Um, we do... He was saying that the, the schedule, the, the schedule he had before the Strickland fight was a lot. You know, he fought a lot of uh, main events, five-rounders as a challenger, as a champion. It's We'll see how good this one year layoff will do for him, especially now that the bell has changed a few times, you know, from Strickland, from Duplessis, there's some, in some action. Rob has picked up a win against Oscar, fighting Hamzat. So, and the Sean Strickland rematch for both of them are always there. So it's, it's some good movement in the middleweight division. And uh, we'll see how Izzy, which Izzy shows up. I do think that break will do nice. I know Hooker has been hyping him up. He feels stronger, but, I don't know, they're, they're teammates, so obviously he's been saying that. But he could have been adding some weight on during uh, the one-year break. Stuff he couldn't have been doing when he was uh, defending or being a challenger for the middleweight belt. And for Duplessis, I think it's uh, continuing the streak he's on right now because he's undefeated in the octagon in the UFC. We haven't seen loss in the UFC. He has, he has all the momentum, all the charisma is on his side. He has to prove uh, he is a better fighter. He talked a lot of crap before that Izzy took personal. So I feel 
it's gonna be a really good matchup. I think it's gonna be a really good fight. We'll see what kind of just what kind of Izzy shows up that day. Yeah, I guess that 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 is kind of the 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 big question that I've kind of seen as the narrative is what kind of Izzy is is gonna turn up. And there's always this dismissiveness almost of Duplessis, right? Like, and I kind of see this fight. I thought of a good metaphor for this fight, right? Have you guys seen Saving Private Ryan? No. no. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, of course. Yeah. Right. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to spoil it for you now, Brandon. Anyway, <laughs> there is a scene inside in Saving Private Ryan where the sniper is up in a bell tower and he's looking out on tanks and he's calling out people. And he lasts a little while, pops a few heads, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then eventually the tank spots him, knocks him out of that tower. Personally, this is a little bit how I see this fight going. I think at some point is he's going to get caught. I, I, I think he's going to. I don't know why. I've just got a feeling that everyone kind of underestimates Strickus a bit. We didn't see the best of him, I don't think, against Sean Strickland. But who do we see the best of with Sean Strickland? So I think he's going to catch him at some point, honestly. I think he's going to have like a little bit of ring rust and, it, and, he might, and he might just catch him. I mean, do either of you agree or strongly disagree with that, John? I saw you kind of making a face at me there. Like, what the hell are you talking about? I'm just saying it's a good thing uh, Taylor is mostly wrong on this podcast. So, <laughs> um, hey, we'll see. We'll, we'll see when um, when Magomed is a light heavyweight champion at the end of the year because Pereira's vacated the belt to go up to heavyweight. I'm saying that I'm not wrong. <laughs> no, I think I there's a personal theory I have. I I think I mentioned last pod. I think UFC is waiting. What happens? Is he here? If he wins, it's going to great matchup for middleweight versus light heavyweight at the uh, uh, middleweight versus light heavyweight versus Pereira. If that's what they're saving, because you know Uncle I have got booked versus Rockage, and I don't think he's gonna fight another time this year, maybe. But I don't know. I just think Izzy, Izzy striking is probably one of the best we've ever seen in UFC. And if we compare to Drakus, is miles ahead. Mm-hmm. Izzy also has a good takedown defense. We know Duplessis love doing his double blast takedown at random times of of the fight. I think Izzy has some good takedown defense, and I wouldn't say I don't know if the wrestling's better than Duplessis. Duplessis is not a wrestler either. He's more of a judo striker type person, type fighter. So we see how Izzy defends against that stuff. And we'll see. Maybe Izzy will might surprise us during the year layoff. I think we'll actually do not ring rust because he has fought it's a year's not that much, let's say. It's considering the schedule he had right before he's been fight. He fought Strickland, Pereira, Pereira, Cannonier. Rittori, Whitaker twice. Like he's been very active. He's kind of cleaned out the division until Pereira had to be forced into it. And I have a feeling we might see some wrestling, some jujitsu from Izzy from Duplessis here. See if Izzy improved on that and if he worked on it. See, because he's been wanting to get a submission. When do you see him? That could be a statement from him if he does that. But like, what can't this guy do? And obviously, maybe I'm underestimating Duplessis. I've been always underestimating him, but I don't know. If the level of competition Duplessis faced is the same as what Izzy faced. But we said that the same thing as <clears throat> Tuporia. And look what Tuporia is right now. So who? I think personally, yeah. I think <laughs> I think Jacob's Duplessis grappling is severely underrated as well. I think he's um he's very, very strong on the takedowns. He took down Sean Strickland for fun and Strickland. I think there was a stat Strickland hasn't been taken down in something like five or six years. And Drakus Duplessis he was able to do that. Um, and then in, in terms of the striking as well, I think he's been overlooked looking at that Sean Strickland fight. You mentioned it wasn't a great performance, Taylor. And it, it did seem like that, but he was the guy putting Sean Strickland on the back foot. Israel Adesanya got beat by Sean Strickland because Strickland was able to put Izzy on the back foot. It could have been a bad night for Adesanya, and I think it was. But I think a lot of that came down to the fact that Strickland kept putting the pressure on him. So if Strickland can do that, the Adesanya and Drakus Duplessis can do it. The, the Strickland doing a bit of MMA maz. It looks like Drakus might give Adesanya problems on the feet if he can push him towards the fence and push him backwards. Mm. And that, that's that's a really good point to to, to jump on there because one thing that I have noticed with Drakus is his striking has got a lot better. Right, I think I think it's got a lot crisper. He's not he still throws those massive bombs, but he kind of plays it out a, a, a little bit more. What do you think? Israel Adesanya has to do. We kind of, I think we kind of know what Jukas is going to bring. Like we kind of know his style and what he's going to try to do. We are constantly surprised in MMA, of course, but I think we've got a rough idea. So what do you guys think Izzy has to do to 
to either finish the fight or walk away with the belt in a decision of, of some description. I would say he has to he has to be more like the Adesanya that knocked out Pierre. And I don't mean that in the sense that it was a better performance by him. I mean it in the sense that he was more aggressive. As as you said, he wasn't scared to take a shot. They land a shot in that fight. Um, I think of Adesanya, if he goes out and puts in a similar kind of style of performance that we've seen against Romero, um, who else? He had, he had some quite boring fights whenever he was. Cannonier. Cannonier, right? a perfect one as well. Um, so there was these fights where Adesanya was point scoring. And I think that's that's going to be the wrong plan of attack against Strickus because Strickus is so unorthodox. Um, I think he's one of them guys. If you if you purposely try and stay in there for five rounds and you're just point scoring, I think he's going to get his moment where he does land one of them big overhand rights or one of them big shots on your chin. So for 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 Adesanya, I think I think he has to fight fire with fire and be as be aggressive and try and put Drickus on the back foot. I do like what you brought up with the point scoring because I feel like that is kind of true with how Izzy fights. He he's a, he's a sniper, right? He stays back works the legs, tries to work on top, but that what works for him. And some people just have better chins because he did that with Costa and then he caught Costa. He did that uh, with Vittori, but Vittori is just a knucklehead that like, he doesn't want to get knocked out. Right. He did it with Whitaker from the second fight. He knocked down Whitaker. It just, some shots probably would just land that. So, so much more perfect. That will just get the knockdown or get the, get the knockout. It, and I think he'll do the same versus Izzy uh, versus uh, Drake. Sorry, I don't think it's going to be much changed. I do see this going probably five rounds of Izzy kind of point scoring. And I wouldn't even say we want to see Izzy the, against a second Pereira fight. I don't think we want to say Izzy versus the first Pereira fight, even though he lost. I think that was a um, he was the one leading the dance the whole time. He was the one he was winning it until um, Mark God stepped in in the last 30 seconds to finish to count as a TKO. Izzy might have run out of gas that fight, but I think it's going to be the same kind of Izzy we have to see. Somebody who's going to be really confident, getting striking on point. And the point you brought up about Drake is he got Sean down. He, he took him down a few times. Sean got right back up. I don't think Drake is could hold down. He 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 does a very powerful double blast. Like he does, he goes from the center of the octagon and he shoots for your legs. But I haven't seen him hold much people down other than Darren Till. And, Till's not in UC anymore. He hasn't won in a minute. So I, I think based off the past fights, we could I could see a path to victory for Izzy, like we saw him winning versus, let's say, Whitaker in the second fight versus Vittori and stuff like that. Yeah, I think you kind of need almost an amalgamation of that Paolo Costa Izzy who was just out there to murder him. Like he wanted to put it on him so bad. And that Alex Pereira one fight, like, like you guys said. I think that's what we need to see from Izzy. We need to see the variation. We need to see him doing different things to do Plessy, give him lots of problems um, if, if he's going to get anywhere near this fight. So time to put your uh, your money where your mouths are, so to speak. We'll go with predictions. Brandon, you go first, mate. First prediction on the pod. That has to be a good one. <laughs> um, a lot of pressure. A lot of pressure. <laughs> I'm going to go out there and... This won't be the most exciting prediction. I'm going for a Drickus Duplessis decision win. And I think everything that Jonathan said it is right. It does struggle to hold people down. But I don't think Izzy's grappling is it at all. Um, Alex Pierre landed his only takedown on Adesanya. Um, yeah, and the fact... It was yeah, sloppy and, as anything, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. uh, it was so, it was so, so sloppy. And Drickus is, his takedowns are brilliant. It does struggle to hold people down. But I think... If Drakus pulls out a Blal Muhammad performance here, I think he could get a decision oh win. No. I don't think he will do it. I don't think he will do it. Um, Where'd you find I... this guy, Taylor? Come on. <laughs> 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 so I'm going for a uh, Drakus decision, yeah. But 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 the mad one, but I've envisioned it. I can see it happening. Well, look, John. I mean, after that, you you've got to counter that. You you've got to go against him, surely. Well, it looks like I'm going against it's 2v1 here, but I'm going Izzy decision. I think we're going to see a master class-ish decision, uh, performance by Izzy. I think we're going to see Drake is kind of eating a lot of shots throughout the whole fight. I think he's going to definitely be... I think Drake is will probably win a round or two, but I think Izzy's going to have a clear decision win at the end of the, end of the fight. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go, like I said, Drake is finish. 
I think he's going to knock. I think he's going to knock Izzy out quite. Oh, not in not not a nice way. I don't I don't see it ending well. There's there's a lot of factors there. Age as well. I put into it. Activity, quality of last fights. I think Drickus is is going to do this. I would even put my hat on and say it's going to be third round. Third round. KO for Drickus and still, and then my boy Bobby Knuckles to come back, beat the brakes <laughs> off of Hamza, <laughs> and then win the belt by the end of the year. Um, did I have that in my predictions? I'm going to have to go back and double check. I'll be well. <laughs> if him, Max Holloway, and Ankalaev end up champs by the end of the year, I'm just going to put the crown emoji on my pot on this podcast Hell for no. the rest of the time. <laughs> right. Uh, next up, gents, is the co-main event um, at 125 pounds. Kai Kourafrance making his return against the last title challenger, I believe it was, mm-hmm. wasn't he? Steve Urseg, who somehow lost. A decision to Alexandre uh, Pantoja back in May. Kai Kara Francis coming off the back of two losses, a split decision to Amir Albazi and a Brandon Moreno loss um, by liver kick. Um, and he's been out for just over a year, a year and a couple of months. Kai Kara Francis has been out. He's obviously had the beef with Manel Cap. Um, who the hell knows what, what's happening with that guy after the Mohamed Makayev drama. Um, but this for me, like, this screams really fun fight. I don't know what you guys think, but this this screams like a really, really fun fight. Two little guys, fast as anything. They both kind of have complementary styles for each other. I think it's going to be a stand-up battle, I, w- I would I would imagine. Um, what, what do you reckon about it, John? I think it's going to be a really fun fight. I think we're going to really like it. I think the flyweights are fun. I think Kai Car fans always brings it. I don't know. can't remember Kai being a boring fight, kind of. I think the most boring, but was his last fight versus Amir Albazi. Um, and I think more than 50% of the people other than the two judges think Kai won that fight and he should have been up there for the belt or something. Yeah. And Steve, I mean, he, he, although he lost his last fight, he outdone himself in a way. Like people th- really put him on the map. Like, oh, Steve is not bad. If uh, Pantoja doesn't have a chin made out of andamantium, <laughs> he he would have won and become champion I think and I'm gonna go with the edge here with Kai Kai Kara fans he has the most experience I believe oh he definitely has the most experience against especially against Steve uh, compared to Steve Ursic he fought the top of the top of the division he fought the Rivals the Morenos uh, he fought Askarov he the Garbrands he he he's been in there he's no surprise it just depends how Again, with Izzy, how Kai comes back with this after having a split decision loss, being injured, and coming back fighting uh, in his con- home continent in the Oceania. So I think it's overall. I think it's gonna be a really fun fight. I don't see another. I don't see another finish here, but I think it's gonna be a really, really fun fight. Hmm. Interesting, um, Brandon. I mean, do you have? Do you, what What did you think about the whole Steve Ursek? Uh, fight with 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 Pantoja. I mean, did you see that going the way that most people seem to? That Urseg picked up the win, and then if so, how does he kind of parlay that then into this fight against Cara France? Yeah, so I think this fight is a perfect example of how fast the sport moves. Because if you had asked me pre UFC 301 and um, between Kai Cara France and Steve Ursuk, who would win, I would go with Kai Cara France all day. But that performance that he put in against Pant- Pantoja, it was, you know, his, his stock rose after a loss. So that shows how how competitive that fight was. Um, for this one, it's, it's a real interesting one because John made a couple of fair points there about Kai Kara France has fought at this high level in the flyweight division before. And Steve Ursuk outside that fight with Pantoja, he hasn't really. So it's a really hard one to call this. I think... I think the the ring rust will play a factor with Kai Kara France. He's been out for 14 months. Um, once his fight happens on Saturday, Steve Ursic has been active. Steve Ursic, I think he'll only get more confident of with being in there with the champ. Yes, Kai Kara France has been in there with past champions and stuff like that. But Steve Ursic has done it more recent. It was only four pay per views ago. I think um that was maybe May May time if I do remember correctly. So. For me, I think Steve Ursuk's just going to be too fast, and I think the ring rust will kick in a bit with Kai Kara France. Hmm. I'm I'm similar. Like I think this is this is really tough. This is really tough to call. I think it's a hard one. Yeah, and it's almost like I'm sure we've talked about it on the pod before, John. But it, it's almost like I want to bring up that argument of these top five fights. Are they top five? 
Yeah, Kai, Kai's, Kai's ranked yeah, five, yeah, isn't he? At this point, it's top five. Cause yeah, just... Steve is still like ranked nine or something ridiculous like yeah. that, even though he fought for the belt. But anyway, and I feel like these, these fights really should be five rounders, especially if you're talking about somebody that could go on and put on a show and then realistically could fight for the belt towards towards the end of this year. We don't know what's happening with Pantoja. There's rumors about the Tyra fight. We're not exactly sure about that at the moment either. So I feel like this this could be extended a little bit more, and I think that would play into Steve Ursic's hands. I just wonder if Kai is going to be able to do what Kai does for two and a half, two and three quarter rounds and just just get there. Sorry, a round, yeah, a round, a round and a half, more, more or less half the fight. If he can win the first the first round into the second halfway through the second i think he could win this fight by by a decision but it depends man it depends i mean the style's really 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 interesting i mean john how do you see the guys like they're both strikers right how do you see the two striking styles matching up against each other it's gonna be interesting um steve is four inches taller than kai car france on height but his reach is uh is a bit shorter his his hands reach a bit shorter than kai france I think Kyra France has one of the better hands in the division. Um, and Steve, I want to say he has good hands. However, we haven't seen him much. You know, he we did see him 25 minutes with Pantoja. And he lands some great strikes, but he did get taken down a lot and was be able to be held down there. He fought a guy like Dvorak, and we we're like, okay, a little back and forth. He didn't really dominate as you'd want want somebody to see a dominating the fight, especially somebody new. And I mean Matt Chanel, he who doesn't finish Matt Chanel at this point, I feel so <laughs> I can't really like no offense, but you know, he's been th- he's been through a lot. He's also on Chanel's on the older side. So I just think this is gonna be a really fun fight. It's gonna be really it's gonna set up how the flyweight division might look. And we don't know what what is happening with uh with um What's his face? I just mentioned him, Ali. I uh, know Amir. Amir. Ah, Amir Arbazi. Uh-huh. Amir Arbazi, because he was supposed to be lined up for he's the shot. Injured forever. He... he seems to have been injured forever, <laughs> doesn't he? I mean, he's been injured longer than Kai Kara France now, because that's their last fight now, and Kai are, Kai oh. is fighting now. They're both were injured. I think, if I'm not mistaken, Amir was supposed to fight for the belt. I think it was, was supposed up, to fight. Right? Was supposed mm-hmm. to fight the number one contender for the whoever wins gets the belt. Got. Yes, it was supposed to fight by Moreno, and then Pat Roy Val stepped in. It's just weird what's happening, but I think it's going to give a clear, some more sense, make some more sense in the flyweight division. I think people are really going to love this fight overall. I just, it's it's hard to, I think you can't go wrong with who you pick who's going to win. I think it's a really close fight of, mm. in terms of the, uh, between them. It's just, is, are you going to go versus experience? In Kai Kara France or uh, the new kid on the block who did well versus the champion but couldn't get it done. Yeah, just um, just as John mentioned, they're kind of about the title picture. Just to finish off with um, this co-main event, Brandon. I mean, would you like to see the winner of this get a title shot, regardless of its Ursig in a rematch? I mean, how do you see the the picture at the top of the division? It is an interesting one because in my head for so long, I had Mohamed Mikhaev being the next guy at getting a title shot in this division, and obviously that is no longer. So it is an interesting one, and I think that really does... John is holding his tongue there. (laughs) (laughs) I can see John holding his tongue, and I'm like, yes, it's someone else. (laughs) Sorry, man, continue. You're all good. Um, Yeah, so I think this this does have to be set up as a number one contender fight with Almir Albazi, obviously, still injured. And I don't think it would be right to put him straight into a title shot anyway after being out for so long. Um, They're doing it with Steve Miocic, so they maybe would do it, but... uh, I think this this has to be a number one contender fight, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that, even if it is Urseg uh, rematching Pantoja. I think we'd all want to see that. So, John, your turn. First prediction I, on, on this fight. How's it going? Just on the uh, your point, I would disagree that the winner will get a title shot. Who do you I think? think? It, I think we fresh... I, it's hard to tell. I think we freshly just saw Urseg versus Pantoja. We saw how that fight went. It happened this year, so it, it can't happen again within this year. Kai Krafthans is coming off two losses, so he doesn't. I don't think he deserves a title shot. But again, uh, the flyweight division, we literally, we literally just saw Ursic at, after two wins getting a title shot. So, in my mind, if I if I don't wouldn't give them a title shot, but how UFC works, it might be. That's just my opinion. 
I suppose <laughs> the the flyweight division it can be typical of that. We've seen Figueredo and Moreno fight each other four times. So yeah. But how how tired were we by the by third fourth fight? You know, very, I, very. the first one was amazing. Moreno then the second fight. Moreno got the submission. And had to do a trilogy and Figgy one. I thought that would be it, but they're kind of they're one one and one against each other. So, anyways, my prediction: I'm gonna go with experience, and I feel I'm gonna go against you guys as well again. But I'm gonna go with Kai Carter France unanimous decision win. Ah uh, no, I'll go with it. I'll go. I don't know. It's gonna be decision, decision, but I don't know if it's gonna be unanimous or split. I, this might be pretty close. Okay, some sort, of, some sort of decision, <laughs> right, Brandon? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm gonna to have to go against you again, John. I'm gonna go for a Steve Ursuk decision. Um, I think Ursuk's boxing, uh, Ur, Ur, Ursuk's boxing is incredibly underrated. It's very, very slick. Um, I think he'll he'll be able to. I think he'll be able to outbox Kai Kara France, and I think he'll. I think his volume will be too much, more more than anything, and I think he'll get a decision win. I'm really looking forward to it, but um, as I say, this is a coin flip. This fight, it's the mm-hmm. flyweight division. The flyweight division's been getting a lot of heat recently, and it's actually one of my favorites to watch. It's like watching the fight and fast forward. Uh, <laughs> it's, it is such a great division to watch, so I'm really looking forward to this fight. Yeah, no, I, I love it as well. And a good thing I love about this is that the division's active. John and I have said many times that the division's active. It's a shame that obviously little Mo isn't in there anymore, but that's his own fault. Nothing we can do about that. Um, I'm going with you, John. I'm going Kai Kara France by some sort of decision. I think I think he's going to clearly win the first round. Second round is going to be razor close. Third round, Steve's going to win. Like, I, I think that's what's, that's what's going to happen. Kai is, Kai's going to come out and go full Tasmanian devil. Try his best to finish him, maybe get close, but that's how that's how I, I see it going. I think on the opposite, I think because the ring rust kind of and the injury coming out from injury, I think Urs is gonna come back. And then uh, when I think Urs is gonna come out strong and then we goes back to his corner, Kai Kara France with Eugene Beerman, they're gonna talk a bit and I think he's gonna put some sense back into him to win that second round and the whole third round is gonna determine who wins. Could well be, could well be. So we jump into the modern day cowboy Cerrone, Dan Hooker returning. After his bomb burner of a fight against um against Jalen Turner, where he broke his forearm, was it, or his hand? And it was just a scratch. It was just a scratch, gents. Nothing to worry about. Hmm. Um, we're coming up against Mateus Gamra. I mean, Mateus Gamra, we know, we know his pedigree's right up there. He's coming off three wins now against Jalen Turner, Fiziv, although the Fiziv one was the leg injury, so a little bit uh controversial, and an RDA unanimous decision. I mean. I kind of don't want to put it out there, but I can see Gamrot dominating this fight. Anyone agree, disagree? I think it's very, very possible. Um, we've seen the level that Gamrot can grapple at. That his his fight with Islam Magachev, that is some of the, the cleanest and the slickest grappling exchanges that I have seen. And he was he was really competing with Islam on, on the ground. Dan Hooker does have an 81% takedown defense, which could come into play, but I don't think it'll, it'll be good enough to stop Gamrot from being able to take him down and a Khabib like performance I can see from Gamrot here because he's definitely not going to let you stand on the feet and strike with Dan Hooker um, he has got he has got a bit of that Polish power you do see Gamrot landing some heavy hands at times but I think Dan Hooker will just be far too quick for him so the clear route the victory for Gamrot here is to take Dan Hooker down and I think he could do it I think yeah, it was... I think um, I think you mean the Zarukian fight right that's what I meant sorry yeah the, Zar- the Zarukian <laughs> yes. fight that was <laughs> I tell you, if anyone if anyone has some time over the next few days before the fight, go back and watch that Gamrot versus Sarukin. What an incredible fight that was. Um, John, you were jumping in to get in there. Go ahead, mate. Yeah, I was going to say the 81% uh, takedown defense is good, but I don't think uh, the amount that Gamrot is willing to prepare to throw some takedowns on him. I, think, I don't think Dan will be able to defend. Uh, I feel like it's going to be like at least five around. We might see like some Mirab. Marab performance to you here. We're just trying to because yeah, Gamrod doesn't have the best hands, especially compared to Hooker. Hooker probably has better hands and hits harder, but Gamrod's kind of a smart guy. He trains at ATT. Uh, he trains with Poirier. He knows the Poirier fought Hooker. He knows kind of the game plan is to avoid the big shots, not to be against the cage against Hooker, especially, and just uh try try to push the pace a little, push the pace a little bit and get your takedown and hold Hooker down. 
I think the only path to victory for Hooker here is um, keeping it on the feet as long as possible and try to catch him with with one of his knees or something like that. Yeah, it has to be. That I think I think the timing for Hooker is going to be everything and trying just to make it as ugly as possible. Get elbows in there if you, if you're in the clinch. Um, I mean, what what amazes me is that Gamrot beats Zarukian, and you see what Zarukian's gone on to do. I mean, it just speaks to the to the level that that this division is at. I mean, Brandon, do you think? The Dan Hooker that we saw, albeit he lost the Dustin Poirier fight, but it was an incredible fight. That three-fight win streak, Dan Hooker, the thunder's kicking off here. I hope you can still hear me, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. The, the three-fight win streak that did James Vick, Yakinta, and Paul Felder, who at the time were all legit, legit uh, badasses in the division, into that Poirier fight. Do you think that guy's still there? Or do you think time, wars have caught up to him a little bit? I think he's still there, definitely. I think well, when you look at Dan Hooker's career, it's, it's, it's very much been someone that has just failed at that very, very final stage. Um, you know, when he fights guys, and to be fair, Gamrot is kind of at the level that Dan Hooker has been beaten in the past. He's only really struggled when he's went up against Islam Makachev, Michael Chandler, Dustin Poirier, and obviously the Arnold Allen, but he stepped down for that one. I think they fell away. So I do think Dan Hooker could definitely pull a performance like that out, like a Dan Hooker of old. But as I said before, I just, I just, I don't think stylistically it's a good matchup for him to perform like that. I think, um, I think Gamrot will, will be too strong for him at the takedowns and I think he'll be able to maul him on the ground and hold him there. Yeah. And it's kind of a weird fight for Gamrot, John. Like I can't really get my head around why he's taking this fight. Not only is it a guy way down the rankings compared to him? But it's also away from home, right? It's in it's in Australia. Like I don't, other than just wanting to fight, I can't see why why he's taking that fight. I mean, Gamrot's at five, <laughs> that money, and Hooker's at eleven. You know, I don't, I don't get it. Why do you think he's uh, taking this fight? Just money. Uh no, I think Hooker is also a name. I think it's also it's a good name to have in your record if you go through like Gamrot's uh, fighting. Fighting page, you'll be like, oh, he beat he beat he beat Hooker, mm-hmm. he beat Sarukian. You're like, okay, it's a good it's a good matchup there, especially with Sarukian being at the clearly the next contender right now, and with Islam being injured or allegedly injured, maybe having surgery now fighting this year, we have an interim belt that could be on the line. And look, Sarukian has a has a L versus Gamrot. Gamrot's a win over him. They're both gonna be on a on a uh, on a winning streak. It could be the determining factor who's going to fight Islam uh, for the lightweight belt at the end of the day. So I, if I was Gamrod, I'd absolutely take the fight. Especially, he hasn't fought in a while. His last fight was versus Jalen Turner. No, Gamrod was oh, uh, RDA, RDA. RDA. Last September. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. He, so it's been a while. So he's due for a fight. It's, almost, it's going to be almost a year he fought. He hasn't fought now. He needs a fight. He needs a win. He needs to gun, get on the mic and call out Sarukian or Islam. And there's their interim belt that's going to happen in three months. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. An, in, an, inter, an interim belt. I mean, what do you, do you think he needs to finish to get that? Or do you just think he just needs to get through Dan Hooker? Like, I, I feel like he, he would need something pretty impressive to, to call out Zarukian. Cause that would be the guy, wouldn't it? You wouldn't go Charles because he just lost to Armin. Does he does he need a finish? Does he need something big? Well, I don't think he needs a finish, but he has he has the bragging rights of having a win with Sarukian. Mm. And it was a fight of the night and probably contender fight of the year when they fought. It was an amazing yeah. fight. Yeah. I don't think the UFC would be against it seeing a rematch, especially that rematch happened now, I believe two years ago, 2022. So it happened two years ago now, and it's going to happen the end. If the fight happens again, it's going to be happening in the end of twenty second half of 2024, obviously. So I think the UC wouldn't be too mad. I don't think the fans would be mad if we especially, like you mentioned, we should go watch the first fight. I think fans wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be, or would be excited for the second fight and see who's the actual number one clear contender fighting to fight Islam. And then I, I the, think, the... go on, mate. I think it may not be the UFC's first choice 
of fight. Um, obviously because Gamrot doesn't bring that big name value, but if Islam Makachev is out for a while, I know Armin Surikian, he's been banned for punching the fan, obviously, but I think that's done in maybe October time. Um, but I think Gamrot, or sorry, I think Surikian, if he gets the chance, he'll want to revenge that loss against Gamrot. It may not right. be what the UFC wants, but you know he's a guy that's been beat three times in his career. One of them was very early on, so we can discount that. He got beat in a very close fight to Islam Makachev in his UFC debut, and he has that loss over Gamrot. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if that is what they've done. They made this a contender fight or for the interim title. Um, and I think if it was down to Surup, he, he, he would definitely like that fight, that, that fight. And especially come back after, I think if he does a public service announcement, the ban gets shortened by six months. But, you know, we can expect him to be out for nine months to a year. And coming back, you, you could see him nearly rather than trying to get that win over Gamrot instead of going straight in the Islam Makachev. So it is something that, that would make sense from Surup's point of view. You said October might... The suspension might be over October, right? If he does I the think, uh, yeah. if he yeah. doesn't, well, I think he wants because there's two pay per views in October. One got <clears throat> announced, and there's a Salt Lake City that needs a co main. And I, don't mm-hmm. th- I think an interim belt would be would slap on there, would be perfect. Mm-hmm. Could be so. Just to flip that coin before we do predictions, Dan Hooker wins. Does he get that interim title shot? No. <laughs> <laughs> only Gamrot, right? The door's only open for Gamrot. So uh, let's get those predictions, gents. Brandon, back to you for the first one, mate. My prediction, City Kickboxing is going to hate me because of do- I'm doing them 0-3 here, but I'm going to go for Gamrot. Um, I think it's going to be a bad night for City Kickboxing and this and this will, will top it off. Um, as I said, I just can't see Dan Hooker having the takedown defense. They deal with Gamrot's as John said, the, the Mirab style performance, which we both think is in common, I don't think Dan Hooker will, will be able to... He might stop some takedowns, don't get me wrong, his takedown defense is good, but just that sheer sheer volume, it's, it's very, very difficult to deal with. So I'm going to go for a camera. I think it'll be a, a decision when it's only three rounds. I think it'll be a unanimous decision. John? Yeah, I'm going to go for a Gamrod decision as well. I don't see it going any differently unless Hooker catches him, but I think Gamrod is a bit smarter than that. And we have a hat trick, ladies and gentlemen. I'm also going with <laughs> the Mateus Gamrod unanimous decision. I don't I think this is not going to be not going to be a, a a great fight, which is pretty handy with the two gentlemen we've got before it. So a fight the I mean, let, let's be let's be honest, gents. Is it going to make it out of the first round? We've got Tai Bam Bam to Ivasa and Jairzinho Royce's strike. Bam Bam on a four-fight losing streak. Cyril Garn, Pavlovich, Volkov, and Tybura. Um, whereas Jairzinho Royce's strike is coming into this off of a win against Shamil Gaziev. I don't know if that really counts for very much, to be honest. Just having watched Shamil Gaziev, he's not the most entertaining fella. But um, yeah, a bit, a bit of a clash in the, he- in the heavyweight division. Um, just going to check in on the rankings of the pair of them. Are they both top 10? Where are they at? It's tied to Ivasa at 10 and Royce's strike in there at 12. Um, yeah, simple question. Does it go out around one, gents? And if so, why? I don't think so. I don't know who's going to win, but I know for a fact it's not going out around one. Um, <laughs> I think this this fight suits tied to Ivasa perfectly because in his last three, he got beat by Serial Gan, but Gan's just that level above. But the three after that, there was always that threat of a takedown, which he had to be wary of. And of course, his last two, he got beat by submission. But in this fight with Rosenstruck, Rosenstruck is going to meet him in the middle of the cage and they're going to stand and bang. And I think that suits Tai to Avasa. He's got to be very, very careful, very careful. And um, Rosenstruck's very, very, very good. And I think if Tai to Avasa comes out too quick and he puts the pressure on too much, Rosenstruck has a really nice fadeaway left. That he likes to land, he's knocked a couple of guys out with it. So Tai to Abbas has to be careful of that, but definitely not getting out of the first round, though. No. Yeah, Jairzinho is a bit a bit of a weird one. He kind of goes win loss win loss. I mean, he did start his UFC career really really well. He beat Junior Albini. I do remember Junior Albini with his with his shorts. Uh, he was funny, man, Junior Albini. And um, then he did Alan Crowder, Andrei Olovsky, Alistair Overeem before he met Mister Ngannou. So. I mean, I, I I see this pretty much as kind of the clean striker in Jairzinho versus the wild street fighter in Tai Tuivasa. John, I mean, would you would you agree, or do you think there's a bit more to it than that? No, I think both of you 
set up exactly how it's gonna how it's gonna go is perfectly perfectly summed up. I think cleaner striker, risen strike, more of a wilder, wild puncher, Tuivasa. I see zero groundwork in this in this fight. I don't and like you said, I don't think it's gonna go past five minutes. It's gonna go within the first five minutes. I think it's gonna be your last finish on the card. <laughs> the last yeah, finish on point. the card. <laughs> I mean, it, it could it, be the first it, two with the way cards are going at the minute. <laughs> it could be. I mean, with, with with our predictions. I mean, I guess the wider discussion here is the relevancy for both guys, right? I mean, it it seems really hard to believe that Ty is ranked higher than Jairzinho, considering the streak that Ty is on. But he's fought the top of of the division. Martin Tybura aside, I would argue. I mean, I think that loss is a really bad loss, actually, for Ty. Um, and R- Rosen Strike coming in, coming in at twelve. It, what is this fight for for these guys? I mean, we've talked a lot, John, about what's going on at the top of the division. I mean, it's it's the MMA Twitter roundabout right now, isn't it? At the top of the division. And then you've obviously got Volkov, Pavlovich, and Gunn. And then you've got that the rest of that little block, kind of blades down to Taibura. So is this a fight for those guys to break into that? Or is it just a fight almost to stay relevant in the top 15? Uh, definitely stay relevant top 15. Just like how we said about the flyweight division and the heavyweight division, other than what's the mess on top, anybody can come up and be the next contender for the title shot once they figure their shit out up the up top there with Jones, Aspinall, and Stipe. But yeah, I, I see this Rosenstrike definitely. I mean, talking about consistency in a bad way, win, loss, win, loss, win, loss. I think he has to get a winning streak like he did. He started in the UFC, and um, I think it's a easy setup matchup for him, especially with Ty. His confidence being the lowest as it has ever been. Yes, this fight didn't have a takedown threat for any of these men, but I do see Rosenstrike coming on top with this, knowing that two of us is in a four fight losing streak. Rosenstrike getting a win will pro- probably propel him into the top five and he has amazing matchups like against Pavlovich against Ty Burrows coming off a loss who has a win over Ty maybe the loser against of Gon and Volkov just somebody you could propel him and be like look we have a cue going into the heavyweight division for the title sh- for the title shot once they figure out what's happening with Aspinall Jones even Pereira maybe at that one point so I think uh, somebody has to get a win here and keep a winning streak going. That's for sure. Yeah, I mean Ty needs to Ty needs to start a winning streak. Poor guy, he needs to he needs to break his uh, break his red red L's. I mean, you've got a guy Sergey Pavlovich and both Curtis Blades who have both lost as well recently. So, I mean, Brandon, do you see with a win realistically could either of these guys go up and face? One of those guys, I know there's a couple of rematches and things in there as well. Or, I mean, you've obviously got Stipe, who's ranked seven. He's gone down. Like, Joe and I made mean, it's overtaken him in the rank. I do not understand what's going on. Mm. I mean, yeah, where do you see the winner of this? We just talked about, you know, the staying relevant part of it. Where do you see the winner of this going? I think it is about climbing the, climbing the rankings, isn't it? And I suppose you can try and create a relevance for the fight, but realistically, none of these guys are really close to the guys in the top three, in my opinion. Um, I think they might be able to creep into the top five, as you say, there's fights with Pavlovich coming off a loss, Curtis Blades, Almeida. I know Rosenstruck has just fought Almeida, so that's maybe not an option. There, There is good fights there, but outside of it being an entertaining heavyweight clash, um, I don't think it's anything more than that, really. I think it is an opportunity to claim the rankings, yes, but the the level of heavyweights outside of the top two slash three at the minute, I just think it's so far below the likes of Aspinall and Jones and even Serial Gan. Um so I think they're just they're just fighting to try and climb climb their rankings a bit and stay stay relevant. I think for Ty it's it's vital that Ty doesn't get beat here. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, it it he doesn't want a Tony Ferguson style losing streak mm-hmm. and he's pretty and he's pretty close to it, but as you pointed out, Taylor, outside of the Tibera fight, it was all against top op, top top opposition. So, um, it's just about staying relevant, and I think that's it. Yeah, and I think you know, just cycling through the the, the matchups there from both guys, we're going to be seeing a lot of rematches in the heavyweight division. I mean, John and I discussed how Tom Aspinall's beaten everybody, so once he kind of 
I mean, he already is the undisputed champion in my eyes, but once he recycles that after Jones and Miocic, it's a lot of rematches. And it seems that way going going down the division as well. I mean, who do you fancy? Like, if you were to look at those two fighters, considering they've actually both pretty much fought all of Volkov, Blades and Garn, the only one that separates them is Jarzinho hasn't fought Pavlovich. Um, Spivak. Uh, sorry, Spivak. Yeah, I mean, Spivak that, Spivak top, that, that top echelon, like... Who do you think has a better chance to climb the rankings with a win in this match? Would it be Jairzinho or would it be Ty, John? What, what, what do you think about that one? I think definitely Jairzinho. He's ranked higher, right? You said he's ranked number nine? No, Jairzinho is 12. 12. Tuivasa is, is 10. Okay, I don't think much of a difference, but definitely uh, Jairzinho wins. He's going to go into the top 10. And then we could probably see... Tybura or Spivak because they both I'm pretty sure they're both in the top 10 both just fought last week so kind of good coincidence that they they're fighting a week apart they could be a next matchup if I was Rosenstruck I would have been watching that fight closely but I I think it's the fan favorites definitely Ty but Ty has a lot of work to do with four fight losing streak but again like I said earlier and with the flyaway it's like you you win one or two and you're right back into the, the top five and people are excited about you and stuff like that. I mean, I miss, I miss seeing Kai doing a shoey. So I hope, I hope he gets back in the win column, but I, I think Rosenstrike probably will get a second win in a row. Like yeah, he has to be, he, he has to, he has to stop that win, not win, loss, win, loss. Something has to go for him to go back because I don't think Rosenstruck fought Aspinall, right? So that will be the only hope we kind of have of not seeing the rematch once Aspinall is uh the full undisputed champ, although he already is. It just depends what happens with Jones Stipe. Yeah, I think with um with Biggie Boy, as his nickname is, I think there's an argument for Pavlovich. I think that's that's the one if you if you're Jason and you win this fight, that's the name you go for because that's the one you haven't fought in the top five. He's coming off a loss. He looked rusty. He did not look good. Did not look like the two same losses guy. So, ah, oh, yeah, sorry, two losses. Yeah, he's coming off two mm. losses, obviously. Um, so yeah, that's that. That's that's the name. I mean, do you agree with with, with John there, Brandon? Do you think Jairzinho stands a better chance in that top five, or well, getting to that top five than than Ty does? I think so, definitely, definitely. Um, if Ty don't don't don't, don't get me wrong, if Ty Tuivasa can go out and get a KO and maybe in his next fight get another KO. Um, KOs and them statement finishes do a lot for you. Look at Steve Ursuk, for example. Um, mm. But I think re- realistically, can Ty Tuivasa be beat four in a row and then within a couple of fights be back in the top five? I don't think it's realistic. I, I think for Rosenstrike, I think if he beats Ty Tuivasa and he beats Pavlovich, that's that's two really good ones that, that, that he's picked up there and that will propel him in, into the top five. So I think Rosenstrike's the obvious one here that can make a chance at climbing their rankings. Yeah, and I think if you're Ty, you're looking towards that Spivak rematch or Jayton Almeida, because mm. Jayton Almeida is the only one in that bunch, obviously, <laughs> Aspinall and Jones aside that he, that he that he hasn't fought. So he That's does an want... interesting matchup. I don't think he wants Almeida, to be honest. No. That no. Almeida would just, be... take <laughs> just take him down, and we just saw Ty being taken down in his last fight versus uh, Ty Burra, what happens. And it's also, it's it's not helping Ty, Ty that he has a loss over Pavlovich and Ty Burra, who are both ranked top 10, top 5 in front of him. So, the, the, clearly the better path is Roger yeah. be back there. Yeah, it's problematic for both these guys. I mean, we but we all agree this is not going out of first round. Who's who's taking that first round? Uh, John, I think you're leaning towards Jarzinho. Have I picked up what you're putting down? Or my brain says Jarzinho. My heart says Ty. But yeah, I, I see Jarzinho... First round knockout. Okay. I would All agree. Right. I would agree in the sense that my heart says Ty, but my brain says Rosenstruck. I think I think if Ty can get the clinch, if Ty Ty's very, very dangerous in mm-hmm. my, my Ty clinch position, if he can get Rosenstruck back up against the cage, can get a hold of his neck and can pull him down and break his posture a bit, he could land some devastating knees, some devastating elbows. But a boxing matchup or a striking matchup without the clinch, I think Rosenstruck has it all day. Um, I'm 
Do you know what? I'm going to go for a tie to Avasa first round, KO. It's in his home country. He's going to sit and talk to the cage and do a shoey at the end. And it's going to be Sainz tie, tie to Avasa back in the wing column. I'm, I'm completely going with my heart here, but that's my pick. I like on that. that on that bombshell, I'm agreeing. That, that, that's where I'm going as well. I'm sticking with sticking with Ty. Um, he's going to just make make the heavyweight division great again. So the next fight <laughs> and the the first fight on the main card is the return of the Leech Li Jing Liang coming off a split decision loss to D Rod Daniel Rodriguez back in 2022. He since bought a very nice suit and had a cancelled bout um, against both Tony Ferguson and Michael Chiesa. It's funny how MMA. The MMA universe comes around on itself. And Carlos Parates, who is on quite the win streak, gentlemen. Um, he's had a couple of fights now in the UFC, beating Charles Radke in the first round with a vicious knee and beating Trevor Giles with a straight left. Before that, he won on the Contender Series with a round two finish. Um, return for the leech. I mean, let's 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 start with him. He's He kind of sat on, in the outskirts of the top 15 a few years ago, right? And then he just disappeared apart from obviously what you know his famous backstage video of him getting a nice suit and everything and then um why was that what why was that called off was that no it wasn't covid was it it was to do with the whole diaz and I'm sad. stuff wasn't yeah. it ah yes yeah because he was gonna fight kevin no he wasn't gonna fight was he gonna fight holland he was gonna mm -hmm. fight i think it was ferguson. holland who's gonna fight ferguson he was gonna fight tony ferguson yeah yeah, it's right yeah. in front of me. I'm an idiot. I can't okay. can't read. So, <laughs> what, what do you think? What do you think about um, the Leech coming back in this fight? As I say, he did put together a win streak before he kind of got um, derailed by Neil Magny, and that was kind of his push towards the top ten. Where do we think he's at? I think he's been fed to the dogs here. To be honest, I don't know mm. what the Leech has done. They deserve this matchup. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Two years out, nearly two years out, and he's he's coming back to a guy like Pratez. It's uh, I don't think it's going to be good for him, to be honest. I can see him maybe been cut or retiring from the UFC after this fight. Um, I, I think he's in, he's in for a very tough one, and it's quite hard to see because he's, he's becoming a veteran of the sport. He's had some great fights. You know, who doesn't, who doesn't love watching the Leech fight? But he's really been fed to the dogs here. Yeah, I agree with that. I he's also older, thirty six. He's been again like Jorginho, kind of winning, losing, winning, losing. He lost a clear, very close decision to Rodriguez. Fair enough. Like it was a uh, like a what a day's notice. He's gonna fight him after uh, Hamzat's first downfall fiasco. So, <laughs> but he's being fed to somebody who's like on a monster, monster streak and like. I don't know what they're going to do with him. If they're going to have a, maybe a, a China card eventually down the future, that's going to be where he could have his last fight. Because like, if you've been off for two years, I think there was definitely an injury there. If you haven't fought in two years, you're on the older side. You're not on a crazy winning streak. He's been on the outskirts of the top 15, but he hasn't really done much with it. There's nobody I could see him beat in the top 15 in the welterweight division, especially with the division being so stacked right now. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm a huge fan of Paratus right now. I think it's he got, although they have the same amount of wins, but I think Paratus has a crazy amount of momentum and experience going on his side right now. I kind of feel bad for Lee Jing Liang now. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. this, this, this guy practice. I mean, if you're going to be a dude who's got Muay Thai tattooed on your chest, you know, you know, you're in for a fight. Picked up a lot of his losses kind of early, early in his career. I mean, Brandon, how, how much do you know about about Carlos? Do you know a tremendous amount about him? Have you seen too uh, a few of his fights before? Like, what's his style like? I've kind of been watching his past couple of fights. The first I heard of him was on the Contender Series, obviously, and then I kind of didn't play much heed for his first fight. But the past two, um, I've I've heard whispers around the MMA community. What is this guy doing opening a pay-per-view? And all I have to say is there's a reason this guy has went from fighting in the prelims and, and a, a, a fight night prelims to open on, up a pay-per-view. The UFC obviously backs him. He's incredibly exciting. As you say, his mouth high is unbelievable. That there, that there body shot, that knee that he won his last fight with, that was absolutely devastating. I, I completely folded him with one knee into the body. He's very, very rangy. He's got a six-inch reach advantage here over the leech as well, which I think he'll, he'll be able to use. Um, 
I think the leech has done something. They annoy the UFC, and they're 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 giving Pratt is this this real breakthrough moment here on the start of a pay per view card. Yeah, this could be this could be a real a real breakout fight for for Carlos, and he certainly. I mean, watching a couple of the embedded, he certainly um, talks the part. You know, very kind of down to earth. What you'd expect really from from that kind of Brazilian fighter, just hard as nails, tattoos on the side of his head, like. <laughs> He's, he looks like he's gonna be he's gonna be a problem. Um, John, let's get to it, man. Is he is he gonna walk all over the leech? Yeah, all over. I think he's the type of guy fighter that like something like clicked in his head a few years ago. He's like, okay, and this is how I'm gonna start fighting now. This is how I should be fighting. And um, coming off one uh, Warrior series, he got a loss, and then after that, never lost again. And just he's on a seven fight finishing streak and they're all round one except for two two rounds and then in the second round that is a crazy streak you're in he's 30 years old he just turned 30 he is in his prime of his life and of his body prime i don't see him losing at all i don't see him losing on the ground i don't see him losing in the muay thai and the striking we know we know also um the leech likes to strike as well keep on the feet he, I think Leech might have some ring rust coming off an injury or whatever it is, you know, two years off. It's hard and you're opening up a pay-per-view versus a killer. Um, So uh, I think we're going to see a first round knockout, if not the latest second round knockout by Carlos. Ooh, so that could, that could be two, um, two first round knockouts to start the main card. That would be nice. And then into the decisions. And then, right? and then decisions, yeah. <laughs> And then the decisions. Right, Brandon, where are you going with this one? Yeah, I'm going for a first round KO. Um, if it's not a first round KO, it'll be a first round domination with a second round KO. But I just I just can't see what, what the leech offers here that's that's really gonna win in this fight, to be honest. So I'll go for a Pratt is K1 KO. Right, right, I'm gonna go second KO. round. I'm gonna go second round. I think I think the leech has got a chin on him. I mean it's only really comes out that that's really destroyed him, I think, in, in, in the first round. And I mean he he really went through him in that in that first round. So I think he'll survive the first and then similar to the Salikov fight, he'll get done. He'll get done in the second. Pretty convincingly, right, gents? That leaves us to the prelims. And as always, I'll let you guys kind of um go into a little bit of a monologue about what you're looking forward to on the prelims, who who stands <laughs> out to you, what performances. I'm going to kick off with the return of Casey O'Neill. I'm looking forward to her getting back, the, the, the Aussie Scott, as she seems to she seems to be known. I think she's more Australian than Scottish, but she's coming off two losses. I, I like her style quite a lot. I, I, I like her. I like her Muay Thai. She's got quite a lot of finishes on her record, including um, Antonina Shevchenko, beat the likes of Roxanne Modafferi, um, so she's legit. She's legit in this decision uh, division, and I think she can have a real run at the top if she can get past Luana Santos, who is absolutely no joke as well. Who's next? Just to back off that the opinion, I think I had high hopes for Casey O'Neill. She is also already ranked, uh, but there's also Luana Santos, who is also kind of coming up the rankings, kind of came out of nowhere, and she's like she's beating off people and. I think people are quite. I think that will be the sleeper of the card. Casey you knows Luana Santos is also the only woman's fight, and I think it will do kind of justice as being the only woman's fight because it's going to stand out for everybody in a way. You know, are people going to like that? Um, the return of Junior Tafa, obviously the younger brother brother of the Tafas. Uh, he's always there for Australian cards. Um. He, I think he was injured in his last fight, and his brother came in to step. Uh, or was it the opposite? I Which think it was opposite. Are we see? I, was the I opposite. think Junior. I think we're. I think we're seeing Junior, and it was Junior that stepped in for Justin. Justin. Okay, but well, anyways, Junior's fighting again now. He did lose by TKO leg kicks last fight, mm -hmm. right? So it's good to see he bounce back. He's in. The, he's opening up. He's the featured prelim, and that's always a good spot. You want to see good big knockout here and go to kick off the main card as the next fight uh he's my mind he's supposed to be better than walter walker um i think they're giving him kind of like a kind of a layup to get back on the winning streak as a favor stepping out for his brother 
Um, a few vets are here. Ricardo Ramos. He's always fun to watch in the pre and uh, prelims in the featherweight division. He's fighting an Aussie dude, so let's see if uh, he could stun the crowd. And um, just another Jesse Aguilar in the pre the very first fight. Although he's fighting Stuart Nichol, uh, Tapology has him ranked number one in Oceania flyweights. Mm-hmm. And yeah, Yusuf Aguilar had is in for a tough matchup, but he's he's been good too. Like he, they don't have crazy long careers so far. They're both still young. I mean, but when you beat Chan and Ross, and you're kind of trying, you beat all, you got to win the contender series. You have a lot of hype behind you. So let's see how he does versus versus uh, Stuart Nicole. And finally, I'm just gonna say Jack Jenkins. He's always fun to watch. It's either a barn burner or a kind of a fun little fight for, for him, especially Herbert Burns, who's not really looking like a UC caliber fighter, in my opinion. Yeah. The last time I remember Herbert Burns was, he was getting carried out of the odds gone by his brother. Has he fought since then or, or no? Um, I can't I was in, remember. It was in the apex. 20. No, no. It says he's, it says he's fought this year, 2024. So must have missed it because yeah, it was that one. It was the Bill Algio fight, exhaustion yeah, from damage fight before that. In, in round yeah. two. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> fight before that. Yeah. So yeah, fight. I mean that that could be that could be adios to uh, to Mister Burns um, if he doesn't bring it against against Jack Jenkins. Um, Brandon, who's jumping out at you from the prelims, mate? For me, the very first fight tonight, John has mentioned it already. Sturt Nickel taking on Jesus Alguara. I'm very, very interested to see Sturt Nickel here. Um, this is very much someone he's got. He's eight and zero. He's seven finishes, most of them in the first round. Um, as John says, he's ranked number one flyweight in the whole of Oceania. He's still quite young. The only thing is the the guys he's been fighting. If you look at the records of them, they're they're not yeah. they're not what it is at all. He really hasn't fought at this UFC caliber. He's also Goliath, obviously, uh, he, he, it was very, very good. First first fight, 17 second KO. His last fight, he won a split decision. And I think even he admitted that he, he he didn't think he won that. There was a lot of people saying that that was a robbery. So this will be interesting just to see how Stuart Nickel fares up against UFC caliber. So that's one of the fights I'm looking forward to. And another one that John mentioned, Junior Taffa taking on Boulder Walker. Um, I, would, I would disagree in the sense that uh, John, you had mentioned that you think this is one, yeah, for Taffa to get back in the win column. Do you think? Yeah, I think I think, they did think him, so? they're doing him a favor because he stepped in for his brother last fight. I think they they like the big Taffa brothers. It's an uh, it's in Australia. They're Aussies. I think they're just trying to give him a kind of a solid win or easy win or a chance to get a knockout. I don't think it's going to be as easy as that. The the, the, the be honest, uh, Bolter Walker. He's eleven and one. He had only been defeated. Last time, that was his first loss in his career. Obviously, brother of Johnny Walker, which is pretty fun too. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I just I I can see that being a really tight fight. I don't think it's a layover at all. If I had to pick someone, I would probably go for Walker. Um, so it'll, it'll, it'll be mm-hmm. interesting to see how that one plays out for sure. I yeah, think Walker just uh, kind of unknown, really. That's why I'm saying that. His yeah. also like the records of his opponents have not been mm. the greatest, let's say. Like, but again, his MMA career is very young, and so is Tafa. Like, they both have twelve. Walker's twelve fights, and Tafa has uh, seven. So it's. And it's going to be mean, a massive, massive reach advantage for Walker. Yeah, like nine inches, nine inch reach advantage. Is so. that as much as that? Oh my goodness! Yeah. Yeah. But we did see Tafa not, I mean, not maybe not him, but like we did see Tafa's knock out t- taller people than them. So I, it's heavyweight division. That's what I'm trying to say. Heavy division, you'll never know what's going to happen. A yeah. one punch could put somebody to sleep right away. And for a card that we're predicting a lot of decisions, at least I am, I hope we get a knockout here. Yeah, I'm team Tafa as well. And this is like, a battle of the young heavyweights, Taffer at 27 and, and Walker. <laughs> the younger brothers. Yeah. At 26. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if they do what people accused. Um, there was a video going around the other week of, of Matt Hughes and his twin brother switching switching on, <laughs> on, on, on Friday. Was it you talking about it, Brandon? I think I read it on, I saw it on your channel, maybe, mate. But anyway, I saw it on a channel going around and uh, that, that could be something that they that they might, that might go and try. Um, just to point you towards... 
Tom Nolan as well. Very entertaining fighter. Mm-hmm. He's t- going up against Alex Reyes. And also Ken Song. Another younger and brother. Ricky Glenn, another younger brother. Yeah, oh, of course. Younger brother. Yep. And that is um, UFC 305. I wanted to touch very quickly before we finish up. Did we, I don't think we did, John, but did we talk about the Francis News or not in the last episode? I don't Briefly, think we did. We did. Briefly, yes. Yeah. So we've got a bit more time. We can get Brandon's point of view on it as well. I mean, what do you think about Francis coming back to MMA, Brandon, and, and taking on Henan Ferreira in that um, that October, what is it, October 19th? Oh, yeah, because that's what we were I talking so. about, if they should do it after the UFC, right, John? Yeah, what, what do you make of it, Brandon? I think for Francis and Ganu, it's a very, very difficult fight. Um, Ferreira, he's, he's got crazy power. It's not an easy fight whatsoever for Francis Ngannou, but it's one that doesn't really make sense to me. And fair play to Francis Ngannou for taking it. I know he's got the involvement with the PFL and all that kind of stuff, so he kind of has to take it. But Francis Ngannou isn't going to gain anything from name value by winning this fight, and he's in for a very, very tough fight. It's one that I'm excited for. It'll be good to see Francis Ngannou back in MMA. He, he tried out boxing, and as much as I enjoyed watching him, not the second fight against Joshua, but the Fury fight I enjoyed, um, I think MMA is where he truly belongs and it's and it's where he's made his career. So it will be interesting. I'm just surprised that whenever Francis Ngannou signed for the PFL, I was expecting them to bring in like big names in the sense maybe like ex-UFC fighters or things like this here. And Fiera, as much as he's in the MMA world and guys that know, he's, he's a well-known name, but he's by far a household name. Um, mm-hmm. So it's just interesting what Francis Ngannou really gains from one in this fight like what was his after plan yeah i mean it's got to it's got to be to chase the co-promotion get get the saudis involved and just throw a ton of money at it and just try and get that co-promotion going and then just be just be the scourge of tom aspinall right because you know like could you imagine like tom aspinall would just be sitting there like what the hell jones fights stipe then he goes and fights in Ghana, which you know won't be till the summer or something ridiculous like that, right? It'll be like International Fight Week or something like that over over in Saudi. So poor Tom's going to be sitting there like, what have I got to do? What have I got to do to fight for an undisputed belt? Right, gents, anything else you want to get off your chests before we call it a day here? Well, how about the co-main that was announced for that fight? AJ oh, McKee. Oh, is it AJ McKee and oh, Cyborg, um, Hughes? Yeah. AJ McKee and Hughes, I think that's a pretty good matchup. Somebody who doesn't watch PFL or Bellator, whatever the hell they are, I think it's a pretty good matchup. I'm always interested in seeing AJ <laughs> McKee. I know they want AJ McKee kind of in the UFC, but uh, probably Bellator slash PFL are paying him more, so they kept him. But I think it's a good fight. And I don't know if we spoke about it, uh, the Nganu thing. I just don't know what's next for Nganu if he does win. Like, like you said, I think there's not much for him. I think just took this fight because he signed a PFL and had to have an yeah, animation. Yeah, and, 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 unless you're chasing um, John Jones or Deontay Wilder in boxing. I mean, we talk, we kind of talked about J. Lee Jones, yeah. didn't we, as well? But I personally don't see that from a commercial perspective. I think the Deontay Wilder fight's much easier to sell if that's the one he's going to go for. But yeah, I mean, yeah. It, has, it has to be that. It has to be the layup with Saudi involved to, to John Jones. But he's got to get past Renan Ferreira first. Can you ever see him getting back involved with with the UFC? I don't think so personally. But nah. in terms of in terms of of legacy, how much of a legacy can and can build outside of the UFC? Very limited, unless they do that cross promotion. I think. I think literally, yeah. unless he goes away, beats Hernan Ferreira, he's done the boxing thing. His legacy is always, you know, the Tyson Fury fight that's going to secure his legacy. BFL Africa, whatever happens with that. That's where he wants to be involved and stuff. Um, and I mean, the dude obviously lost his kid earlier this year as well, which is which is horrible. I was listening to him when Joe Rogan told that story, and it's really it's really really sad. So I think the dude, the best thing for him to do is to chase the John Jones fight. That's that's the only yeah. one that makes sense. Both of the guys age wise, you could see it working age wise. I mean, would they do a special belt for it so that that way Tom can be promoted to official undisputed champion because they have to do fair by that as well. Otherwise, you talk, you could be talking at 18 months without, you know, it's him being an interim champ, which is just a bit weird. So, yeah, from a legacy question, I mean, that's what I think. John, do you have anything to throw in there on, on the Francis legacy? 
I think yeah, he he has a really good legacy. You know, he's not a boxer. He lost to Joshua, so we kind of gonna ignore that. But I think yeah, I mean, UC champion defended his belt. Um, fought Fury. He had a crazy win streak. Avengers lost in the UFC versus Stipe, who is people consider the greatest heavyweight of all time in the UFC at least. And you know, Dana says that the one that got away is him versus Jones. Like it's gonna happen with Aspinall now. It's gonna be the one that got away. I don't see any cross promotion. We know Dana is gonna refuse that idea. Is gonna deny that idea. The only chance we might have is like if Jones retires the UFC and PFL signs him. But Jones just signed an eight fight con eight fight contract deal before his gone fight. Before Cyril gone, so that's gonna be he's gonna sell six fight left on his contract. I don't know if that's even gonna be allowed. <laughs> yeah, getting through that contract. <laughs> yeah, it's not happening. <laughs> Look how Ngannou barely went through it and couldn't negotiate a deal. I think his legacy fighting wise is gonna be awesome. Is gonna be considered one of the best to ever do it and in his own terms. And like he spoke on the road, Joe Rogan experience, like he uh, he is the ambassador of P- of PFL Africa. Is they're gonna build gyms. Uh, get some talent there. I think that's going to be his second, his other legacy. I think he's going to be focused on that. We're going to see a lot more African fighters like Nganu Usman coming out of there. And he's going to be with the big help of uh, of Nganu. We might see some lower tier African fights, fighters happening in Africa, not just South Africa. People in smaller arenas that are like in Cameroon, Nigeria, Kenya, places like that, and grow the sport from there. I think that's going to be his legacy that he's going to leave off. Be more proud of. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would, I would kind of hope we get the John Jones fight just so we can put something to bed, so that we're not asking because then you'd be asking, "Oh, well, Jones, but he never fought Aspinall or Ngannou, right? At least fight one of them. Let it be Aspinall, yeah. but at least fight one of them." I think if the most likely one, I think, is going to be Francis with some Saudi money, Uncle Turkey, as Nick Pete of Fight Disciples likes to say, is going to come in with that big cash. It's going to be the biggest. Pays. It's going to be the biggest troll draw from Jones for not fighting either Aspinall or Ngannou. Yeah, Retiring sure. as a heavyweight champion and be like, oh, I'm the greatest of all time. For fighting sure. a 77-year-old Stipe Miocic. <laughs> what does that do for John Jones' legacy? I think... Uh, I think, Plus well, it. I suppose I suppose his legacy, his, his legacy as a light heavyweight is already cemented. And as the GOAT, possibly it's already, I, I would say, yeah, it is cemented, but he wouldn't need to start running his mouth saying he if he beats Steep that he's beat the beat the greatest heavyweight, so he is the greatest heavyweight because it's not gonna look good for him at all after not fighting Nganu and Aspinall. As long as he beats Stepe within like round one, then I'll be like, Okay, you beat him the way you're supposed to beat him really quickly. Here's Aspinall. Aspinall will probably be he's definitely gonna be the backup there. So they're all both gonna be kinda fresh off a uh, weight cut because well they're not gonna be doing much weight cuts on a heavyweight but I think Jones if you really want to be considered the greatest greatest of all time you're number one you think you gotta beat Aspinall you beat the greatest heavyweight now you're gonna be the greatest modern heavyweight and I think that's yeah. gonna cement his heavy his legacy. I think you gotta get to be the goat you gotta get one of those guys on your on your CV a Garnu or Aspinall and then nobody else is going to come and touch you for for sure. But oh, yeah. listen, gents, it's been an absolute pleasure. Brandon, welcome into the podcast. Even after your Bilal Mohammed comment, we'll, we'll let you <laughs> we'll let you back for the for the review next week. Uh, game la- Red Fogger's last last warning, last warning, <laughs> <laughs> first and last. Uh, John, thank as always, mate, thank again. you. You're welcome, man. John, as always, thanks for your time. Uh, we'll be back next week to review this um, UFC 305. And we'll we'll hope to catch you then. Cheers, gentlemen. Cheers. Cheers, man. Thank you.